Hello, Deanna. Hey. <laughs> um, and welcome to everybody who has already arrived. I see we have a full house. Um, let us know where you're coming from and, um, and maybe what brought you here today. Um, why you wanted to go on a slow walk with Deanna and Michael. Um, so, well, I just want to start by telling you I'm thrilled that I got to spend the next hour and a half with you. Oh, yeah. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> um, and I think that we are able to connect, certainly in the most historic moment that I've lived through. Um, so it's exciting for me to just, as the name suggests, to slow down, and take it in. Not all of it. We can't take it all in. <laughs> we'll just <laughs> No, not all of it, uh, us empaths especially. <laughs> yeah, but tell me, um, let's start with you, Deanna, just why, um, what was the inspiration for, for this for you, this idea of this long, slow walk together? You know, um, there's a lot of going on, a lot of, especially on social media, you know, a lot of going back and forth. And just so people understand, I am looking at Michael's face. I, I can't do the thing where I look at the thing. I need to look at you while I'm talking. So um, there's a lot of going back and forth, a lot of quick thinking, a lot of fire, rapid firing. We're all busy. And to take time like this and not be interrupted, that we might not agree on all things. And that's, I hope so, right? So we can just have this really rich conversation and um, explore and unpack things. You know, it might be one or two things, it might be 10 things, but just to see where it goes like a stroll. Yeah, um, I immediately felt um, resonance around that. It was an immediate yes when you reached out. And so here we go. So we're gonna start this slow walk together and then we'll invite people in um, mm -hmm. once a month or however often we decide to do this and see where the conversation goes. Yeah, yeah. For those that don't, um, maybe I'm assuming that most people that are here today um, know either Deanna or myself and our work, but this is going to be broadcast as a podcast. So um, you're at the live recording. You get all of the the blips and the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and the passwords and everything. Yeah, but let's um, let's assume that people don't. Um, who are tuning in to the podcast, don't know our work that well, um, maybe don't know all of the terminology that we use. So as yeah, we sure. name like a death doula or palliative care, maybe we can stop and give some mm -hmm. But um, Sounds good. That sounds good. Great. Well, I mean, maybe let's kick it off by how we, um, the two of us in our own ways respectively got into. Okay how it chose us or how we chose it. Um, maybe do you want to start and we'll just see okay. where it um, So let's start out with um, hospice. I just wanted a couple of definitions. Hospice is um, someone who has an illness with a prognosis, expectation to live for six months. Palliative care, you might hear me talk about that and Michael talk about that here and there. Palliative care, can be begun from day one of diagnosis concurrently with cure directed treatment for as long as the person's dealing with the serious illness expecting to recover fully and then if the person does decline towards their death when they go to hospice palliative care will be the only method of care so prior to hospice it's two plans of care and then if someone, uh, the acute care treatment plan and the palliative care treatment plan. And then if someone doesn't, uh, isn't gonna survive, then they go into palliative care treatment plan, which is a more intensive care. People seem to think it's nothing more can be done, but actually it's a more intensive care. So that's probably good for definitions for right now. Uh, end of life doula is just a role, a name. We put on this role of people coming forward like me that they have a passion to serve at the end of life somehow. And they realize they're good at it. They realize they want to, and they don't fit in anywhere. 
they might not fit in in hospice or or in healthcare somewhere. So they go, you know, I'm really good at this. Or I, people seem to want me around or I seem to be that go-to person or like me, I'm a hospice nurse and I want to work around and advocate on the outside of things so I can bring more uh, unity within, right? So there's all kinds of that. And um, that's, so the role, the name we're calling that right now is end of life doula and liken it to a birth doula, um, it's same kind of thing. We're accompanying people out, they're accompanying people in. And so me, I got into all this, I um, was already a hospice nurse. And when my mom was diagnosed and died within five weeks and she didn't want hospice, <laughs> it was like, oh my God, because the kind of cancer she had was going to be a nightmare. It could be because I took care of a lot of people with this cancer. And so um, what happened was, is that I knew that the medicine that hospice used could work for her too, even though she wasn't on hospice. And so that's what I set out to do. So I created a team with my sister, her doctor. I had my mentor who was my hospice nurse. Um, she mentored me the first day of my hospice work. She was my doula, if you will. Um, and we created this team for my mom. And she's like so many people came on to hospice like the last five or six days, but she had excellent palliative care through those five weeks. So that's how I got into this. It's like, you know, people know about hospice, people know about um, how to get there if they're open to it, but people don't know that they don't have to suffer. And most people die, are dying as they go down and they come into hospice and those last five or six days of dying or those last 30 days of dying are done with hospice, but those weeks prior, they're on their own. So if people knew about palliative care and its appropriateness from day one of diagnosis, there wouldn't be that suffering that everybody writes about. All the physicians write about it. That's what people are trying to help uh, with is that, that time period. That's what got me into all this. Yeah. Now, but you were, before you took care of your mom, you were working as a hospice. Mm -hmm. There's not not everyone is drawn to this work and and obviously not drawn in such a powerful and passionate way where they make it their life's um you know mission right totally. for yeah. those of you that joined us thinking that this was a um, live podcast about walking and leisurely stroll <laughs> yeah, sure, I'm confused but <laughs> about the end of life work that we both do uh, and so nonetheless, <laughs> there, why do you think um, the puzzle piece of working in end of life fit um, with, you know, was there an earlier experience? Do you think there's just something a part of your- um, Oh yeah, oh, oh yes, yeah, so well, it is. <laughs> so when I began, I was a new graduate nurse and I started on the oncology floor for the goal to always work for hospice. That was what I wanted. So then I begged the hospice in town, the big nonprofit hospice in town, please let me train with you too. I know I'm just a GN, they call us GNs, graduate nurses, and we're green. I said, I'll clean trash cans, I'll clean toilets, please just let me come, please, please, please. You know, And I'm just kind of a pain in the butt. And so they let me <laughs> come and they started training me. And um, so I was working, on the cancer floor and I was working uh, in hospice and I was being trained in both. And what was so shocking to me is the people that I was taking care of in hospice were the same kinds of people that were on the oncology floor who were going towards their death. Not the people that were gonna be okay, but in, in the hospital in the cancer floor, it's the people who are very, 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 very sick. And not everybody who's that sick will die, but many do. So when, I saw that why weren't we using the medications and the protocols and the algorithms that we were using in hospice when it's the same person, sort of, you know, the same type of person with the same symptoms, but we weren't doing that at the time 20 years ago. Um, I did a lot of crying back then. I, I was a hard nut back then, but I went home after a lot of shifts and just, I couldn't, the suffering and I just couldn't deal with it. Well, when I, the hospice hired me full time. Then I started seeing the people that I took care of on the floor coming 
to me as a new case manager, I'm their new case manager. And it was just incredible. Um, some people were afraid of me, were scream when they saw me because I reminded them of the torture that they had just been through. Some people were so happy to see me, they remembered me. Some people, you know, didn't remember me or not, but I knew that the, they, the, the, the processes, it was shocking and it made me so, it impacted me so much that this suffering was unnecessary. That's what then made me start to cry at hospice. It wasn't that people were dying. It's that they didn't need to do all that suffering I was hearing about for the months and weeks and sometimes years prior to them coming onto hospice service. So I'm like, why, why, why? You know, I'm this, like I said, I, I tend to ask a lot of questions. People aren't always so grateful about that. And like, why, 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 why? And nobody could really answer me. And so when all this happened with my mom, I had no idea that the NHPCO, our national trade group for hospice and palliative care, I had no idea that they were starting a grassroots coalition at the time. Uh, it was called, it's about how you live. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was uh, sponsoring that. I had no idea. So when I came out of the gate and my mom died and I'm starting to, I didn't know if I was gonna anger people. I didn't wanna hurt anybody. I didn't want healthcare to get mad at me. Nobody was talking about it. And we would do these coalitions together. And I went to San Diego and we're trying to figure out how do you talk to churches? Okay, how do you talk to workplace? How do you talk to therapists? You know, that kind of thing. We're just really ground level. And I didn't want people to get so mad at me that they wouldn't listen to me. So that was my first fear because there was no, nobody was talking about this. Yeah. So I really thought I was going to incite a lot of rage. Well, I saw that you had, did a course in conflict resolution. I sure did, but that was after, <laughs> that was after, <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah, it was well, great too, everybody should do that if they're in this business, they should do that. I mean, I'm thinking of the, um, the Buddhist wisdom around um, so much of our suffering is about resistance, um, and that so much of the suffering that you're talking about was a resistance, is, and still remains, a resistance to coming to terms with the fact that you know, we all do eventually die. Um, and the, when the type of care that we can receive and the type of, um, you know, well, palliative care, for instance, um, not being made um, available to patients, not just because of um, the patients not wanting it, certainly not, but oftentimes folks that I, in palliative, um, palliative care physicians that I talk about, as soon as they approach um, a patient or a family or realizing that it's time for them in the ICU, they'll often have their colleagues that aren't, you know, the oncologists, et cetera, send them the other way and say, no, 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 out of here. We're, we're beating this, et cetera. And it's like that this notion of beating an illness um, or winning um, where, where is, is really getting in the way of people getting the type of care that they need, regardless of whether they're going to, you know, um, it's, they're going to improve or they're not, right? There's, a, there's this resistance to it that I think causes a tremendous amount of suffering. Yeah, the thing about that, though, is we are wired for survival, right? So there's that resistance. There's so much that that needs to happen before somebody would just kind of go, okay, <laughs> okay, I'm dying. Um, they it really, a lot needs to happen before then. And most of the time, the question really is for people and the family, maybe the healthcare too, but is, are we there yet? Are we, are we really there? Because so often people are beating things that they used to die, you know, with. And so uh, as a hospice nurse, I met people at the very, very, very end most of the time, especially with cancer and heart disease and things. So they weren't, um, so even then, when people are at the very end, they're still asking, are we there yet? That's like a quote I think we should have somewhere because I think that's the thing that stops most people, even when they have advanced directives in place and even when everybody understands that this is what mom wants or grandma wants, even when all that's in place, that are we there yet really, really stops people. Most people really want to live. Yeah, well, and, and to clarify, I'm, I'm not talking about resistance to the idea of dying. I mean the resistance to the idea of even allowing palliative care in the door. 
Um, like you said, palliative care is not just for people who are dying. It's for anybody with a serious diagnosis, right? So you're thinking the resistance is they won't even allow palliative care. If they knew about it, that it was this kind of treatment, they still might not let it in because they are confusing it with hospice. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's tremendous palliative care um, uh, leadership all over the country constantly talks about the, the how do how do they have their services be more embraced? How do they educate people about what palliative care is? Not just, you know, externally, but internally. Oh yeah, right. A great deal of resistance. I mean, you were talking about people not getting the care that they need and, and exactly. suffering results. Um, whereas, you know, um, so I, I just think it's something for us to, to look at um, the resistance. I'm not, I'm not suggesting everybody should just come to a Oh, no, I know you're not. Yeah, no, I know. There's a lot of talk like that, though. And um, I guess I've served a lot of young people. I've served a lot of people with young kids and teenagers and, um, you know, 60 year old. I'm, I'm going to be 60 in a couple months. I don't want to kick it yet, you know. But I remember when I was 30 and 40, I just felt so far away, <laughs> you know. And so that's what I'm told by a lot of 80 year olds and stuff. They think, you know, I just thought it was a little bit further away and I'm really good to stick around a while and no, but I, I wanna hear about you. I, I just love all the things that you've been doing and around, I love the, um, what is it? The rest provocateur, food provocateur and things like you and I just love all that that you've been called. I mean, for me, this work really, started um, when I was, I guess, in second grade, um, quite frankly. Um, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And um, my father was 72 when I was born, um, which is something of note. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, which is an interesting time to have, uh, to make some more babies, for sure. And um, you don't, have a child when you're 72 necessarily feeling confident that you're going to be at the high school graduation or at the marriage, et cetera. Um, and he, a lot of people, when I tell them, you know, my father was, um, while well, I was in second grade, my father was diagnosed, they assume early onset, which it wasn't right. in his 80s. Um, but our family dealt with his diagnosis. And this, and I don't mean this. Um, as a judgment, just as a kind of factual mm -hmm. account, dealt with his diagnosis um, very poorly. Um, and my immediate family, extended family, um, there weren't open conversations about it. It became almost a shameful thing. Um, he didn't get the care he was, uh, he needed because of that, was put in substandard nursing homes, even though we had the resources for much better care. Um, and, and we didn't celebrate the fact that he was going to be here for a limited amount of time and we should really take advantage of it and mm -hmm. celebrate the um, faculties that were still available um, and the, the parts of him that were still very much alive. Um, he just kind of put in, was put on this, in this box of shame, really. And um, it had a huge negative impact on my family. Um, really kind of like a slow motion seven year train wreck um, or explosion. Um, and we're still traumatized as a family yeah. as a result um, to see the patriarch of so many, you know, yeah. he, he had children for 50 years. Um, you know, I have an 82 year old brother, um, <laughs> half a brother. So, um, to see the impact of that um, diagnosis, um, our inability to talk about his, um, his impending death, and then our inability to grieve um, was really, for me, formative in the sense that I never wanted anyone to ever experience what I went through and what my family went through. And that's um, where Death Over Dinner came from. It took you know, these things take time that we just these experiences. You don't, you know, at 21, you're not like, I'm going to work. Well, you, you, it seems like you might've been, but <laughs> yeah, I begging, uh, not at 21, but at a fairly young age, but um, 
you know, it took me a while to really understand how important um, this would be in my life. And I spent um, about 20 years really focused on human connection. Um, and I think that that was really a result of seeing um, how poorly my family connected and, and what was missing and what I was, there was this deep yearning for um, vulnerable, authentic, um, you know, heart-based connection. Um, and so I spent about 20 years gathering people in a variety of different ways, um, working with folks like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Nature Conservancy and um, the Obama Foundation, et cetera. A, a lot of extraordinary people and extraordinary organizations, bringing them together to talk about the hardest things that we face as humans. Mm -hmm. um, so I hosted salons and dinners and weekend retreats and full week events focused on um, genocide and homelessness and racism and wealth disparity um, and all of these topics that we don't necessarily ask our leaders to consider when they're not in front of a camera. Yeah. And I found that if I cooked powerful people um, a very like soulful meal um, personally and invited them to dinner and made a beautiful, created a beautiful invitation that we would go places together um, and, and go way beyond political views or religious views into like the terrain of the purely human together um, so powerfully and so almost immediately if we asked each other the hard questions, if we talked about the vulnerable topics. And so that's where I started to realize that's where the trick to human connection is, um, is vulnerability, um, is talking about the things that we're afraid of. Um, and so that's, that's where I ended up in, uh, you know, wow. creating death. Um, and, and it's really, it's not about, it has nothing to do with death. Um, we don't, I don't know anything about death. <laughs> it's about talking it's about opening up and sharing yeah it's about um what happens when you create a safe enough space yeah um and you haven't politicized the container or the, the experience um and you give people the time um and you have some skin in the game yeah. that's Always cook for people who are like well we'll get a caterer you're you have presidents coming to dinner it's like no 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 i'm gonna go and you know and i'm gonna use this kitchen in the back and i'm gonna <laughs> like figure wow. out that's so amazing it just opens them up and so that's Absolutely. that's where um death over dinner and then drugs over dinner um as a follow-up what's about what was drug i saw that drugs over dinner what's that about well for those that don't know death over dinner quickly um deathoverdinner.org. It's a free resource. Anyone can go there um, and organize a dinner. All of the dinners are hosted um, individually by people who create their own experiences and, um, and it's their dinners about um, our mortality, about grieving, about um, planning, facing, you know, the inevitable, etc. A variety of different reasons why people come to Death Over Dinner and host dinners. And when we launched death over dinner um there were over 500 dinners on the first night um we launched on august 23rd almost eight years ago seven and a half years ago on the day that elizabeth kubler ross died um wow. and thanks to the um, elizabeth kubler ross foundation and the nhpco there were 500 dinners in 30 countries um and we knew we were onto something yes yes Yes. Over a million dinners. Um, wow. And about three years later, um, or maybe it was only two years later, we decided to create um, a follow up platform about addiction. Um, oh. In the height of the, um, I, well, I don't know if maybe it's still the height of the um, 
opioid uh, crisis, but I think it, you know, I, I actually think there's been a little bit of improvement. But nonetheless, we gathered together Ariana Huffington and Gabor Mate and all of these incredible leaders that have yeah. been affected personally around addiction or doing work in the space. Um, and Dr. Oz ended up partnering with us, nice. uh, the Surgeon General at the time, um, Vivek Murphy, and we created a national night of addiction dinners hosted by Dr. Oz and all of these folks. And wow. Yeah, so that was, that was incredible work and it continues. People can still go to drugsoverdinner.org. Um, and uh, and it, it just hadn't, for me, it didn't have the same resonance and it didn't have the same cultural resonance as Death Over Dinner. Um, and and it, they're powerful experiences as well. But um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, very so, nice. Very yeah. nice. Um, so I'm curious, um, your you know, lineage, of practice um, has, when you talk about it, it includes, um, you know, it sounds like a childhood in Catholicism, um, and a, a tradition of Sufism. Um, Not for very long, <laughs> maybe a year. Okay. But yeah, no, we've an atheism. My atheism. grandmother, my mother's mother was an atheist. Sean, and, Sean, um, Sean. Shaman, that's my own thing for the last five years or so. Yeah, we've been we've been on an adventure. <laughs> I've been on <laughs> me and all myself have been on an adventure. Um, yeah. I mean, even some um, Hindu mysticism um, with you know Ram Das as being a. Um... Well, just through him, he he he's something else, as most people who know him know. But yeah. he 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 with a look with a time with him not very long but there's a woman and I don't remember her name but she was behind me when this happened and so one time I was on social media and I said something like like five minutes with him completely transformed every cell in my body and I I, I just still feel the chills and she said she said I was there I saw it like I'm getting chills now. It's like, whoa, it, you know, when you think it was, I'm making too much of this or, you know, Danielle captured it. So there's a picture I always get to have because she captured it. And this woman stood behind me and felt it and saw it. And so anyway, I feel validated. <laughs> I don't know why I need, I don't need it, but it was just in my early time of absorbing that. And is this real? Is this for real? So we don't have to spend a lot of time with people for transmission and for powerful exchanges, like most of us know in airplanes, <laughs> talking to people in the airport. But um, yeah, my, my first experience of death was hush hush. I was six or seven. You can't go, this and that. And then my second experience with, de with death, I was in Laredo, Texas with my Hispanic grandmother. She didn't know English. I didn't know Spanish. We had moved down there when I was 13 and it was when I was 13. And she was <laughs> dressed in black and all of that. She had her veil, I saw she had her veil. I was on the couch laying down in jean shorts. And she says in Spanish, come on, come with me. And I got my flip flops on and there was rocky roads. Back then there was no pavement where she lived. And I had no idea where we were going. And we were going to the corner and the corner store was a woman named Serapita and that's where we used to buy our candy every year. When we would drive down from DC, um, every year we would go and buy, hang out at her place all summer while she was dying. Well, she was probably like four foot tall and the store was maybe five foot five. And then they kept adding to the little house. So by the time we got to her bed, we were all like this, but the ladies were sitting around I was amazed, I could feel it. Now I know what I was feeling. At the time I had no idea what was happening, but I could feel something different as we approached. And then my grandmother took her place and all the ladies were praying and nobody's like, what is she doing here? And they were all dressed different. <laughs> you know, I'm just coming from DC and I'm in my short shorts and all that. Anyway, I was like, I belonged. And, um, I can't describe the feeling of that I was worthy enough to be there. 
it just really, it still affects me, you know? So people go, well, didn't you know from then? And I'm like, no, I didn't know then. It just was something I did. It was just something I was invited to. And then through time, you took care of your aunts, you took care of people sick. You took, I took care of my grandmother with my aunts. You know, we're just taking care of everybody. I didn't realize that not everybody did that. So I did that. My grandmother died when I was like 25 or so. Then my aunt died, uh, the one that I helped take care of my, her mother. My grandmother, she died about 10 years later. So it's just like I got, and then I, another aunt uh, died, but I didn't get to take care of her because she died suddenly. But we were all together doing this for years, you know, since I was little. And so when I go do talks or retreats or whatever I'm doing, I always ask people, has anybody, did you grow up learning this? Did you grow up with it? And not many people raise their hand. And, and you would think, oh, since I did all that, that it would be in my mind and heart consciously to do this. And it wasn't. What got me to do this was a semester in nursing school. I was just bored out of my mind in nursing school. And um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So I'm making up all these plans to be a remodeler, which I'm not a remodeler, but my ex-husband was, and I thought, well, I can be the contractor and I'm gonna, and I was just always making business plans. And one day in second semester, they said, we're gonna have um, community rotation. You all have to choose this long list. And it said hospice. And I knew immediately that I needed to have that. And I really wasn't sure completely what it was outside of it was about dying, but I needed to have it. And there were 40 people in the class I was one of the worst students, like you can imagine, because I was bored and they knew I needed to have it too. There was like five or six people that vouched for me and said, you need to pick her, pick her. She needs to go. I have no idea where all that came from, but they did pick me. I got to run around with a hospice nurse that was like MacGyver. Remember MacGyver? She was just like that. So I was the luckiest person in the world to follow her around. And she, we would go to like Home Depot she would make things for as people were declining, like an occupational therapist would. Um, I watched her sew. I watched how she handled people. And it's like, that's what I'm going to do. I just knew that's, that's it. And from then on, I studied, <laughs> went to class. <laughs> I had a purpose. Yeah. I mean, I think so many of us um, are either drawn towards things that we have, like, you know, or have experienced, like you were just in, in the natural lineage of caregivers, of caretakers um, that had been unbroken, right? Um, right, right. It hadn't been broken by industrialization. Um, yeah, you're right. Some of us are, do the work that um, is around something that we've lost or something that we're missing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, my case. I mean, I think a lot about the connection between um, food um, and and death. I mean, obviously, obviously, death over dinner. It's right there. But in the in the same way, we have a very clear understanding of what's happened to the food world. We understand that we had an unbroken lineage around food. Um, you grew. Um, it, different things based upon where you lived in the world. And you had different recipes um, and, and cultures and traditions that were based upon history and story and they were refined yeah. and they were meaning, like they're potent mm -hmm. rituals, making different um, dishes together. Um, and then we industrialized food and we stopped growing it um, outside our back door. Um, we stopped cooking together. It stopped becoming a community act. Mm -hmm. And in the process, we completely ripped it of its nutrients to the point where food is what's killing us as opposed to the thing that, you know, nourishes us and keep us, keeps us alive. Um, so many of our, um, our chronic problems are based upon our diet, oh, yeah. which is just this tragedy that the thing that is really most important to our vitality has been turned inside out. And I think that, I think in many ways as we've over-medicalized and over-industrialized death, 
um, moves it out of that unbroken lineage that you were part of um, and put it into this, um, you know, into this highly sterilized, um, highly mechanized system. What we also do in a similar way is we rip the nutrients out of death. And, that, you know, and I, I think you and I both might have a, the same kind of response where we can talk about it. I don't like when people talk about the good death. I don't like when talking necessarily about a, a beautiful death. Like I, that's fine if that's what happened, but right. I'm not part of the good death movement. I think death is terrible. Um, I like the idea of dying well, um, but I also really like the idea of death being a community act and grief being something that we confront yeah. and and have lives in us and we carry with us so that we can get the nutrients that we need from the experience to become yes. people, right? Um, and otherwise it's this dull lot, like a, a death without meaning um, is, you know, is maybe second only to a life without meaning is the, is the worst thing I can imagine, but. Yeah, when you were talking, what I was thinking about was how much joy food gives people. Like when, by the time, I would say by the time I'm with a family, it's game over. <laughs> it's, I'm not called on the front end. I'm called at the end, end, end. And so I can tell you, and it's always um, usually scary for them. Are we there yet as part of it? Sometimes it's not, sometimes people know what's happening. But I can tell you from just being there now more as a doula, I've been a doula since 2005, since my mom died. I went out and educated about pre-hospice. At the time, we called it pre-hospice palliative care. Now they just call it palliative care. I think they're trying to take hospice out of it completely. <laughs> and we're trying to trick people with supportive care, but they know now, like everybody, <laughs> there's no way to get to this, you know, without not trick people in a bad way, but like, here, learn this concept of amazing care that has nothing to do with dying, but that hospice uses as its sole method of care. That's hard to detangle, you know? How, how are people supposed to detangle that? But anyway, um, the food, the food. I can't tell you as a hospice nurse and as a doula, as a hospice nurse, because I didn't do a lot of cooking as a hospice nurse, you don't do that. You just, you know, you go and you have to leave. You bring food, but you don't get to, you don't stay like you can as a doula. Um, and people, how many times I had to talk to people and talk to families about the whole, um, where, where they were staying um, in a lot of pain and staying stuck was of course in the feeding. And say mom or dad had renal disease and heart disease and all these things that required a special diet. And this person, their loved one has been trying so hard to stay on that diet. Well, now they're dying and the family can't let go of the diet so the person can enjoy some food or, things like that. And some of the worst grief is, is really caught up in that. And so in my early days as a hospice nurse, I didn't know that, you know, and so I'm talking to people about why it's appropriate, you know, so having this conversation of why it's appropriate, that it's okay that we go down less on food, that you make it a little more soft, that they can't absorb it, like all the whole teaching around food and nutrition and what's happening in the body. Um, goes on deaf ears, goes on deaf ears. If your grief is in there, like the way it is for some people. And that's why they can't stop the different, the, you know, the different diets that were keeping the person alive, but now we don't need to, to maintain them. So once I, a few, it took me a few times to find that out, uh, dealing with families and seeing the tremendous grief. And then from that point, what they taught me was that it might take us, if I have the time, like not me having the time, if they, if they take a while to die, when I get a person <laughs> to be involved in their care, if they take a while to die, then we, we have time to unpack it. And little by little, gradually talk about what are they noticing in their loved one's decline. And once a person can really get that on their own, then they start to let go of the things that they thought would keep them doing well and being well and living. 
and it's not an easy walk. It's a very, it's a long walk. It's a slow walk. It's a slow walk. And I've helped many people that just completely fell to the ground when they finally realized that the diet wasn't, that that's not what usually makes a person fall to the ground. I have a terminal illness might make you fall on the ground. There's other things that you would think, but to say this person should now have pureed food, you wouldn't expect it. But when they realize what that means. So there's a lot of tender conversations, you know. Well, the grasping again, it's not, you know, that kind of, um, you know, there's a few things that I wish I could, you know, share with everyone, um, things that I've learned in my still young life. But one is how I talk to myself. <laughs> I got rid of having a negative dialogue internally um, several years ago, and that's been transformative. And I know it's not it's not an easy thing, but if I could, that's one gift I'd love to be able to give to people. And the other is learning about surrender. You know, I mean, this, these are, these are conversations, what you're talking about surrender um, and about people grasping and holding on to something, um, some level of normalcy um, because yeah, that, that is, that's a symbolic move. Um, it's a, it's a return. Talk about doulas. Um, you know, they're, they're returning back towards um, a, a state where they um, you can't process full foods, um, need, oh, yeah, yeah. need to be taken care of in a, in a deep way, just the way that, you know, we came into this world. Um, you know, I'm, I had a very, I love that um, end of life doula and um, work came so many, in so many ways, like was inspired by the midwife movement and the oh, yeah. doula movement. And, mm -hmm. Um, I have two daughters, one's 20 and one's 12. And one of my daughters was born at home. Um, and, and this isn't, you know, sometimes and often people just feel more comfortable with hospital births and that's right. not great. This is not a judgment on that. Right. I had two very different experiences. One was at home um, with a birthing tub um, and we had five midwives. Mm -hmm. We had two naturopathic physicians, two having their last birth before they were naturopathic midwives, and one friend who happened to be a naturopathic midwife. And I felt like I was in this coven in the best possible way <laughs> of female genius, um, taking, doing everything to make it the most meaningful, significant present, because you're talking about reminding people to notice, to become present to the process so they can become present to the fact that somebody is dying. And the whole experience in, um, in the home birth was about presence. Mm -hmm. And that there were candles lit because it wanted to be womb-like. And there was a feast that was shared after um, my daughter was born that felt like this like magnificent Rubenesque, like um, festival wow. of life. And it was such a joyful experience. And then the, the um, hospital birth was like the beeping, the lights, the getting poked and prodded. There was no present, you know, the epidural, the this, the that, the like, well, it was a nightmare comparatively. And of course it's overshadowed by this incredible new birth but when I think about the two experiences like they fill me in such different ways right and it's yeah. so that connection between those you know it, it means so much to me to see this incredible doula movement which is now becoming a phenomenon right it, it is it will like it's still so new it's still so new I just talked to someone today and he's saying I just found out about this and this is who I am and I remember when I first had the shoot, when the, the, it dawned on me, because I too had a home birth with my second child. And it, when my mother was dying, I just had this huge blowout. I could be like the, <laughs> I could be like the home birth midwife. And with, with you, when you were talking, was your home birth after the hospital birth or before? It was before. Well, so it's a perfect example sometimes of, when, a, like, say, a death midwife, death doula comes in the scene, 
where everybody's has their own reaction and and uh, experiences with death before. So that's what I was so traumatized from my first birth from the what happened in the hospital that didn't need to happen. And the home birth midwives, I had two, one was a lay midwife and one was a nurse midwife. Um, and um, they helped heal that experience. They helped empower me to get my power back around um, the stuff that happened it was terrible. I, I try, you know, I'm pretty strong and I've, throughout my life, I've taken stands when I hadn't had therapy yet. You know what I mean? It's just like, I didn't know any better. And I, and so I know I, I have a strength in me. I know that, but sometimes you go through experiences, especially in the medical field, when um, you're not with somebody who is humble or somebody who believes in the strength or of your convictions and things. And so even with the birth plan that OB just so when the midwives came back in, they didn't say, oh, you don't need a doctor. Oh, that because of what happened to me, they found a doctor for me that checked me out, made sure I was safe and okay. He spoke with me. He said he'd be right there if they needed him. He trusted them. Like they really set me up to be okay. And I was, the baby was born in 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's a whole different experience. Like you said, we didn't have the feast though. I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> yeah, no, it was... It was right before um, Thanksgiving and they ended up, um, uh, friends of ours ended up bringing us a whole Thanksgiving feast, nice. campaign. It was just this extraordinary thing, but I would, the strength of um, the, you know, the, uh, my first daughter's uh, mother was the power and the grace in in her strength. I mean, it was, we weren't actually together at the time um, when uh, she gave birth. We um, had broken up and it was a surprise pregnancy, and, but I was there, you know, very much committed. And in seeing her give birth to August, like fell immediately back in love um, because of that power, like how, when you do give someone the opportunity to really step into their power, into their strength, yeah. I mean, I think that kind of in, in, in death and, and dying and end of life, giving people the opportunity to show their, their strength and their tenderness, yeah. right? In their courage. So many people, again, grasp and like you have to, one lesson that I've learned is you have to let people know, even the people that are dying, um, let them know that it's okay. Um, it's okay to let go and let the family know that it's that they need to tell them that it's okay <laughs> that a lot of people need to let everyone know that it's okay to like unclench totally There's, I'll, I'll add something to that just don't tell them a bunch of times <laughs> I had this one man I was caring for and said if one more person comes and tells me it's okay I'm not effing ready yet <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny, I, you know, because we're all, you know, trying to be so serious about it and we're sincere, you know, we want to help people. And I, it, I've i never heard a story like that before in my own practice, but that one time when he says, like, really, tell them to quit telling me that. Um, it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but yeah, I think the, the medical does medical people want a beautiful death too for people when i say beautiful death i mean that it's not with a bunch of noise and it's not with all the trauma of, of you know treatments not working or uh, because we can't have the surgery it's usually there's so much drama there's so much drama and can't do it and um you know this intensity at the end of life if someone hasn't chosen hospice um, that doesn't happen when someone chooses hospice and then may need to go to the hospital for some reason. There's a whole different feel. And so when that, with that birth experience really, really got in, taught me when it came to my mom and her death and how I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be that person for families, the way those home birth midwives were there for. They changed the trajectory of our whole life. Those birth midwives changed ancestral wounding. They changed the way um, my mothering, because I didn't have the kind of mothering that I gave 
How would I learn that? The midwives um, were amazing. They, they taught me as much as they did. Then they connected me into a network at the time, La Leche League. I don't even know if they're still around. I'm sure they are. But just, I, they, in, they indoctrinated me into a whole group of people and women and families that really valued um, the connection that people have through the ages, you know, all age groups and that children are little people and, you know, just the respect for everybody. So that's, I feel a very um, similar experience that end of life folks can do. Um, maybe in the hospital, they can't do it as much, but there's a lot of people describing um, these days, some better experiences around it. Feel very grateful, right? But it's not the best place for that. I mean, even though we know some people would prefer to be in the hospital and die, I understand that, but more people would rather be home. And I know people are trying the best they can, but everyone will see, most people say a hospital is no place to die. You can help it. Well, I mean, there's, sometimes home is not the right place to die for sure either. I mean, people, it's a lot of work. It is. Right. Um, and you need a, a whole network of support. Yeah. And for a lot of people, the type of care they need is not available to them because yeah. they don't have acute symptoms. And so they can't get the right coding so that they can get the type, right type of hospice, you know, in-home service. Somebody coming by once a week to check on somebody is not necessarily all that helpful. No, it's the caregiving that people need. Yeah. You know? caregiving and that custodial caregiving and it's yeah. pretty rare that somebody has in their home environment a custodial caregiver who is up for that um and that's where you know really the the community piece like how can we once again really claim it back as a community act and the more that we hide it the more that we um make it taboo even though i do want to talk about the word taboo but the more that we make it taboo the the less likely it is that the community is going to come together to help people with that custodial act. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, that's, that's really the around, that's what's on us and so many people who work in this space is to increase that literacy so that people can ask for help. They could pull on their network, not feel like they just need to go to professional services as you know. As yeah. Well. Oh, yeah. You know, when I, I listened to your TED talk a few times, I really love your sense of humor and your, I just, you're just awesome. Anyway, your giggle, when, when you were talking, you said um, something about, oh, early on about people really are okay talking about this. I, I've always felt that way. People have, you know, you'll read articles, oh, Americans don't want to talk about it. I'm like, that's not my experience. Maybe if they're actually dying they might not want to talk about it, but I've known a lot of people dying that did want to talk about it. So I don't think it's on everybody's mind that, oh, I don't want to talk about it, you know? Well, I think we give them terrible invitations. Um, yeah. You know, it's not, if, if people were inviting me to crappy dinner parties <laughs> and I said no to them, and then someone was like, well, he doesn't like dinner parties and be like, right. no, actually it was just, didn't want to go eat dinner at that person's house for X, Y, and Z reason. Like you need to invite them into the conversation in a way that actually resonates with people. I mean, I think of it like courtship um, instead of this transactional, um, well, you should, we should have the talk, right? Like I'm, I'm not available for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, should, all right, I already am not of it. You've just told me something that I'm doing that's wrong implied. And now you've just had the talk. I'm like, no one wants to have the talk. Like, no. forget it. Um, and so, I mean, that's, I've never had the experience, not once in the last 10 years where I tell people the work that I do and have them um, move away from me. Right. right. Like, those of us who do work in this space, what we find is we say what we're doing and there might be a slight <laughs> a little bit back and then you can't get rid of them. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, when I give a talk, um, at a, especially at a conference that isn't a death conference, mm -hmm. I, talk, I go out the backstage door and <laughs> because I'm not a therapist and I know that there will be a lot of 50 people who want to talk to me about There'll be that. a long line. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You know, I, I'm not I'm not the person that I'm going to tell you that you should talk to the people in your lives, but I'm not necessarily going to say lay down. No, you're so right. You're so right. And, you know, when, when end of life doulas say, you know, they they do want to serve professionally, someone who really serve professionally and they're worried about that. And I say, look, hon, all you got to do is show up to a business networking meeting because this is what I did in 2005. Someone pointed me to a business networking. Meeting. I've never been to one in my life. And I'm like, well, what is it going to be like? Well, just everybody, you know, is there eating lunch and you'll just stand up and say who you are. And I'm like, um, I don't know how to say that, but okay. So I said, whatever I said, hi, I'm Deanna Cochran. I serve people at the end of life. Even just saying that I serve people at the end of life. People nearly choked. Forks were being put down like this kind of thing. Nobody was talking about that at lunch at a business networking meeting. <laughs> so I had a business coach tell me, just keep it brief. And when they start doing, when the, you start hearing the silverware clatter around, just stop, pause and say, I'll be over here after the meeting if you wanna talk. And I would have a line of people wanting to tell me about their experience they had recently or something that happened before had they known there was something like this they would have loved to had some support or they're going through something so people that want to do this work and really support others through volunteering or through professional services all we need to do is let people know that we're here and people will want they want so they need support some people do some people have excellent support and some people don't um, more people know and, and as far as the i i in no way blame the medical community um i think that they're doing an incredible job um the at, at the work that we're doing i think there's just no way that when we started be thinking in the way um of western culture in this cartesian way right in this mechanized industrialized way would you know we 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 left completely from the divine feminine <laughs> into this very um, Newtonian Cartesian world, right? And it started to drive any, everything and everything in culture. So there's, it makes perfect sense that we would over-industrialize and over-medicalize even, you know, end of life um, without question. Um, and, you know, but I've, I, I've been doing some work with, um, the Cleveland Clinic and Memorial Sloan Kettering and um, incredible um, leaders in the in the healthcare space. We actually built a whole new edition of Death Over Dinner, a healthcare edition, um, with the Cleveland Clinic as our primary partner. And I've was recently at a dinner um, with the whole um, cardiothoracic department. Um, and so, so this is for the people who are working. It's not for patients, it's for people who are working. This is for clinicians, yeah. yeah. Okay. This is, so you have their whole heart surgery department and the Cleveland Clinic is where they first successfully performed um, a heart transplant surgery. Um, so it's a pretty serious room. Um, and about 75 clinicians in the room, um, some of them were part of the teams that wow. completed their surgery, et cetera. Um, it was some emeritus physicians there and they're at a death dinner and they don't seem happy about it. A lot of them. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and looking at me like, who is this guy? Yeah. Uh, why are we doing this? I mean, I came because, you know, Mark Taylor or so-and-so said I should be here, et cetera. Here we are. We're essentially going to be here to decide it's a terrible idea. <laughs> and, um, oh, and one thing that I did want to say before I forget, I think, one of the reasons why we have over medicalized death is because death has changed completely. Yeah. You now die of announced deaths and, and the idea of a terminal diagnosis is such a new phenomenon. Totally. So, I want to hear what happened at the dinner. So, um, I, I get up, um, and 
it was nervous. Um, and I, and I started the introductory um, talk before we started dinner. And I said, well, so you practice medicine. That's what you do. Um, and you understand medicine as something that staves off something that um, keeps us alive, something that beats disease, beats illness, like without question, that's, that's how we understand medicine. And, um, and I said, well, tonight, like tonight, I want you to do something a bit unreasonable. Um, I want you to just step into this space with me where we actually consider that death is the medicine. Nice. That facing our mortality is- Now, where do you get all this, Michael? Where do you, this is awesome. <laughs> That's so good. You know, I'm telling these, these doctors this, right? D is the enemy. Yeah. Uh, and you could just hear like, like literally talking about Totally. Well, bodied and uh, experiences, you could just feel the air change entirely. Totally, I felt it. I felt it. Yeah. And and they softened. Yeah. Um, like, so deeply, um, and then you had um, doctors tell you know, and then I and I let them get to their tables, etc. And you had doctors telling their. Um, nurse the nurses not there but the nurses and um, and and the care teams about stories about their like there was one who talked about um, their brother's suicide and how he became a doctor because he wanted he didn't want anyone to ever die again because he was so traumatized by his brother's suicide and there was such tenderness mm -hmm. from his care team from this you know, almost godlike yeah. doctor personality, a heart surgeon. Yeah, totally. And you saw, and I watched, and I was like, that care team is going to operate differently from now on. Yeah. And, and it, it really is that this, how do we create enough space and enough presence where, and, and it's not that death can be good or it, it, right. it, keep death as awful, but how about increase the opportunity for healing? Right. Yeah. Well, what you're describing is what I feel like we do in our, I call them Anam Kara sessions, you know, John O'Donohue's book, Anam Kara, Anam Kara. Just it, me, it just captures everything for me. The relationship I have with the person dying is really that. And then I found later that other end of life doulas, hospice nurses, we see each other like that. There's something that goes beyond words, a kinship. And um, what we do, a lot of hospice professionals are in my program. They know all about death. So yeah, I have a comprehensive part of end of life stuff, but another huge part of my program is a personal journey. So you, you have ex experienced hospice professionals, physicians, and they're doing that aspect of the journey. Um, that's, that's what's transformative. That dinner that you had for them and even introducing a, just a perspective shift. I like to look at it like, here's where my mind is now. And just if somebody says something just turns me this way, now I've got all this possibility. And that's what you did for them. And that's what I see happening with people who are willing to go there. There might've been some there who weren't willing to open their mind, but in their heart really. But, and as death workers at, in hospice, I feel like it's a barbaric system that we have actually. I, I was presented at a hospice convention one year and I thought I, I didn't know if I was gonna get thrown out, but I had the, um, it was such a conviction and I saw heads nodding and even for some physicians nodding because there's too many people for one person to go and do 15 to 17 visits and families and some two and three visits, the same family during the week with things going on. For one person, like a hospice nurse who has, who's, in, who's the charge of the plan of care, who has to be there all the time. They can refuse the social worker, they can refuse the chaplain, but they cannot refuse the hospice nurse. And hospice nurses are pronouncing people, pronouncing their deaths. They're admitting people, they're, uh, pronouncing them, they're taking care. It, it's really a lot and it's barbaric to me because I can tell you there were more than a few times when I had five or six people die within 24 hours and there was nobody 
telling me, Deanna, why don't you take a break? I had to call one time after the fifth person I pronounced within that 24 hour period and say, I, I, I'm like in shell shock right now. And there's a part um, back in the day, and, and, and to me, I'm 20 years nurse and 20 year hospice. And to me, back in the day, it's 20 years ago, um, it was, you were fragile. You were considered fragile if you asked for a minute or something. I'm sure people had compassion, but um, it wasn't like today where people know you're fatigued. Um, you know, so That's I'm gonna have, yeah. You know, burnout, addiction, and suicide in, in the healthcare profession is, yeah. is, is unforgivable. Yeah. We are asking too much. Um, yeah. Secondary trauma, um, and there's moral distress, and there's so many, and, and there's not taking a moment. Um, do you know Jonathan Bartel's work? No, I've heard of him. So Jonathan is a nurse in the University of Virginia. And he started a practice, he's a Buddhist. He started a practice um, where to have the care team pause um, at the end, at when, when a patient died in the ICU or in the emergency room. Um, and you know, instead of the, um, just the business as usual where the attending surgeon like leaves and the nurses take care of the body. And there's just, it's, it's just, there's no, there's nothing sacred in that moment. Um, and that, I mean, and that is what I think, of course, is what you felt as a child with your grandmother um, in that back room is the sacred, yeah. right? And Jonathan has created this moment where the care team stops and there's a very simple um, uh, script that's read that's non-denominational about, well, you know, we're gonna take a moment to pause to honor this patient um, we honor this person to say the, their name um, and they have to do 30 seconds or a minute of silence. And then if anybody has anything they need to say, um, there's an, a space for them to say it. Um, and it's the simplest and most obvious thing. Um, and so healing. Oh, right? yeah. So a moment of healing. And we actually, moment to, yeah, to, in the hospital, there's not a moment to spare, but he, you're taking the moment. Taking the moment, and there's also, I mean, even in hospice, where you think that there would be this type of ritual, there's yeah. often, um, and we worked with Jonathan and turned it into an app. Um, so oh, now, what's it called? It's the pause, and it's in oh, the app. yeah, yeah. In a bunch of different languages, so, um, and it's being used all over the world, um, but he's, he's- They're taking it into the hospitals, um, the clinicians, the pause, or you mean- Oh, yeah. Yeah being used in many, many different healthcare systems um, as standard practice now. Um, and, you know, I mean, this, we are, we are watching the transformation of compassionate care. I also think that COVID, um, which we haven't talked about um, yet, but I think that what we're experiencing right now is the formation of the future of compassionate care. Um, yes. Yeah, there's a lot going on with COVID, yeah. Well, and I, I you know, we share some similar mentors, um, folks like Ira Bayak, um, mm -hmm. mentor of mine, Frank Ostaseski, and, um, and people I look up to like Katie Butler, et cetera, were, who in many ways, uh, you know, so many of them have, and you have helped form what it looks, what compassionate care at the end looks like right now. And at least Ira and Frank and Katie, they're, they were really shaped during the AIDS pandemic. Um, yeah. And it, it really often does take a crisis at this scale to have that perspective change happen, to have something be shaken up so severely, to have it like, we can't be near those that are dying. We can't be at funerals. We can't, you know, all of these things have been put in jeopardy which means that they, we now are gonna really reconsider them. So I think that we're watching like happen day by day, the formation of what the future of care and the future of death looks like. Um, if there's some sort of silver lining happening. Yeah, and I, I feel like we're also 
you know, the trauma of it all, we haven't even begun to see the people um, that are, that haven't been able to be with their loved ones. I mean, I've had it in my own family um, where, so I, I felt it, not my father, mother, sister, or brother, but my cousin and her husband. Um, it was brutal. Okay. And, and it just, you can imagine, even if it wasn't something you've experienced, um, people in my sessions, I used to do public sessions at the beginning of COVID. None of us knew what in the world was going on, but I started having public sessions and there were healthcare workers in there just rose and couldn't even speak. And people in there going through these things. And as we're walking through together to see like, what's going to come, how, how are doulas going to care? How can we support healthcare? What's happening? All of that. Um, what started like it took a few months for us, I guess, to come out of shell shock about it and try to come up with something. Your paper came out that was amazing. Um, but what I'm noticing about like we just had this big conversation the other week, where because we're like there's a nurse that works on the floor, somebody was going through a terrible tragedy, she couldn't touch them or anything, she had her mask, gloves, gown, glasses, like the whole thing. And this person she's trying to talk to is just sobbing and they can't talk. So what's happening is we're having to develop a whole, this whole other aspect to ourselves. Those of us who aren't energetically aware are now becoming so, whether we use that word or not. And so like you're saying the silver lining, I guess another one like mother's, what was what it? Necessity is a mother of invention. If you cannot be there, you have no other option but to pray, which is to me, long distance healing. Um, being in a room with somebody, but you can't touch them. It's, we were talking about how, like when there's no crisis, you can talk like this. Um, we're talking about how um, the natural tendency might be to go reach for them or touch them when it would be inappropriate maybe that your reaching and touching would stop them from crying. So there's a lot of lessons we're learning right now, even though it's not all about, uh, we can't be there when the person's dying and they can't. that is a tragedy. And we're gonna be facing this and we're gonna need to deal with that on top of everything else that's happening from lockdown. But when I think about how end of life doulas can be helpful, um, is, is we're, we spend a lot of time with the family. So we spend more time than even hospice can because hospice aren't caregivers, right? They're, they're, they're consultants. And doulas, many doulas are not caregivers either, but they stay for long periods of time and accompany families. So with this awareness, a lot of doulas are having is that, yeah, I can't do this, this, and this, and this, but I, I can hold this energetic pause. I can, we call it pause also, but it's a little bit different than what you're talking about. Um, giving people this room and now we can't touch them gives even more room and we're noticing that it's positive. Wow. Huh. You know, I'm a hugger. I would have never learned that. Well, sure. I mean, when you're this. reliant on it, it's almost like you have to build the superpower. Of yeah. Becoming Reiki healers is what you're saying. <laughs> I wonder. I don't know about that because, you know, energy, me, energy medicine or energy principles, Reiki turns a lot of people off. But if you look at it like um, when you pray, if I'm praying for somebody, even if they're in the same house with me, I look at that as energy and I'm, I, it's distance healing, it's prayer, it's intention, it's connection, <laughs> however you want to look at it. But if that's all you have, I think we're going to work with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the ways, the places I was going with your long list of different healing lineage, lineages is in kind of in that MacGyver sense, <laughs> yeah. you need all of the different resources, you know, we, when, when we're dealing with such an intense human, yeah. Experience, right? Like yeah. God, that you have um, exposure to all of these different lineages and can teach from those because there's wisdom that is more relevant to different experiences or different situations from each different tradition. There are rituals, yeah. you know, and, and you and I both know, I think a lot of dogmatic uh, religious thinking goes out the window. Um, yeah. 
you actually are talking about about a confrontation, right? Yeah. Like totally, yep. And even with death over dinner, people are like, well, um, it must be about religion. You know, religion must come. Up. It's like, no, I've done death dinners with the more the, the church leadership of of the Mormon Church. I've done dinners with um, Buddhist monks. I've done dinners with um, the Episcopalian um, church leaders, um, Catholic, Southern Baptist, um, you know, Muslims, you name it. We don't talk about the afterlife in these conversations. We don't talk about dogma. We don't talk about right. um, uh, cosmology. We talk about how we want to live. We talk about what matters most to us. We talk about what is our priority. And, and I imagine when you're in these experiences with families, people aren't going to be like, well, that is not part of my religious tradition. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. And I've had people tell me, well, how, they're really worried about culture and religion and being and knowing all about every everybody and race and everything. And I try to help people relax about all that because not one of us represents. I'm Hispanic. I don't represent all Hispanics at all. You know, there's many dialects, many forms of Spanish, many countries, many religions, many, 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 the same thing with every race and culture on this planet. So nobody represents. So what I like to share with people is if you're serving a family that's very religious or they're strong in their culture, they don't need you. They're not going to ask you for that. They have it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're just going for the ride. You're going to learn something or two. But the people that don't have a practice, right? The people who maybe lost their childhood faith and don't have it back, or the people that aren't strong in something, they do, they look to us. They want to know, do you have any ideas about this or that? Even the people strong in their faith, when I come around, they'll just ask for something about dying. Well, we have this and we have that. We did our prayers for the dead and we did this. But what do you, do you want, have anything to offer, you know? So once in a while, I'll get that from people with really strong faith traditions, but most of the time they have their priests or their chaplains or their tradition, their everything, and they ask me to join in on it, but I don't have to know it. So what I, what I ask people to do is, it's just like what I did in oncology. When I got a new person that I was taking care of, I get five people. In oncology at the time, they only gave me five people because they're very, 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 very sick. So I would learn the disease process. I would learn the labs. I would learn what goes with this person. What And, and I'm thinking medical, right? Because I had to be, I was a nurse. Well, as a doula, you're not a nurse. Uh, you're um, an, a companion. So do the same thing, you know? Or if you're a friend of the family or uh, got drugged in by the neighbor, whatever it is, then do your study. Who are they? Go out there and learn as much as you can about people like them. They might be Sufi, say, but maybe they don't practice this kind of Sufi. There's a few lineages of Sufi. So you'll learn about the lineage they are, right? So that's the way I'll look at this. I don't, I don't get all, I, I wish people could really relax that it's your love and your attention. It's that heart is that what people feel and want with us. That's what they need, all of us, <laughs> right? It must be really hard. I mean, you must have to teach doulas about boundary settings. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. a lot of people don't know how to set boundaries in their life, period. But period. Especially, especially when it comes to doing this work, because that seems like one of the most important aspects. It is. And it's actually stronger for the people that will be non-professional or just the volunteer, um, not even volunteer. Let's say the person who's the go-to person in their family. Of the, yeah. there's that person in the family that's really good at it you know good at it right good at being there people turn to that person that person needs to learn more about structuring their practice than even professionals because with professionals there's a little bit more rigidity around it there's a little bit there's money there's a couple of things that are going on that put helps you make the boundary so you can totally let your boundary down of course and not pay attention and you run ragged, but there's a couple of more safeguards around having um, boundaries than you are if you're the go-to person in the family. And it's even more important to me that people who are that needs to have, they need to have some, 
They need to really get it, not, not to be rigid or harsh or unyielding or um, I'm going to tell my family I have a boundary. You know, it's nothing like that. It's about so that I can continue to show up for you. I need to nourish this. I need to nourish this. I need to nourish my body. I need to nourish my mind. I cannot show up. And I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. I've done three and four and five day vigils um, as a doula where even if they put me in a room somewhere to sleep and they feed me and I, I put all my boundaries. Okay, so um, I'll be there, but you're there overnight. Don't call me till the morning. You know, if you need me, call me. But like I put all the, I need to be somewhere separate. I had a hard time in the very beginning with all that. I would say, I'm going to sleep over there. They had a place for me, everything. By the second night, I'm sleeping right next to the person who's dying and they're all in the other room, you know? It's because, you know, when someone is dying, they trump you. That's the way I, I, most of us feel. So in, to say that I'm more important than what's happening right now with them when they're dying takes a lot of um, convincing. <laughs> but I think when a person has burnt out enough times, fallen down, and I've been in the hospital, I gained a hundred pounds. There's a lot of things that have happened to me because that were my teacher in all of this. So um, there's a lot of hospice nurses that get strokes and heart attacks and die from the pressure, the enormousness of this. I had a doctor, a DO for years. And during my first six years in hospice, I went to see him all the time. And I had a therapist that I would see. And I thought I was doing good, you know, cause I didn't have anything going on at that time. Um, but I just was doing proactive care, right? Had a DO, we were doing medicine, functional medicine kind of stuff and vitamins. And, and then I was going to my therapist every couple of weeks and I thought I was good, I ended up in the hospital with unknown respiratory stuff. And when I went to the uh, Dr. Thorson, I said, what the hell? And he goes, Deanna, I have never seen anybody take better care of themselves than you. I have not seen it. You are amazing, but you deal in life and death. You're right there at the veil. It's enormous, the amount of suffering that you're in the middle of. I know you're conscious as you can be, but this is what happens sometimes. You, there's no explaining. And um, we don't always know why the body sputters. We just, it's just sputtered. You just sputtered, you're out now and carry on, right? So even when you try sometimes, it's, so when things like, every time something like that has happened to me, when I've come to a new place, a new limit, a new boundary, it has taught me to back it up a step because I think I can handle this and I can handle this, but really what it showed me, I can handle it when it's back here. <laughs> I have to like, I'm a super coper. I call it super coper. I'm a super coper. I don't notice till it's here. I have to start noticing when it's here, <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're, the irony is that you are, um, not, irony is maybe not the right word, but the, the tender irony is that you're out there helping people to notice <laughs> these, these things. <laughs> we all, what, we right? Things, right? You, it's what you need to learn. It is, yeah, we definitely do practice what we need to learn. Um, it's true. And the one thing, I mean, we only have a couple minutes left, but I'm, I'm reminded of, um, and, and there's some people on the call that I don't, that I don't know. And um, some people have heard me say this before, but, um, I love when people talk about death being taboo, right? And then, and then they say, well, we need to break the taboo. And, and, then, I, and then I get an opportunity to say, but well, we don't, um, because you just, we just need to understand what the word taboo means. Um, and the word taboo is actually from a Polynesian word, um, T-A-P-U, tapu, which means a place that is sacred or holy. Mm. Um, and it's so, it, it, it is very much that you know, like you said, you're close to the veil. Um, I'm thinking of your experience with your grandmother. Um, I'm thinking about how transformative and, and how, um, you know, how much energy um, in the good and the bad and all of it is around this work that it can knock you out. Um, how, did it, how did taboo get to taboo? How did taboo get to taboo being a bad thing? 
Well, so you know how we say that burial grounds are taboo, right? We have this kind of notion that that's like forbidden to go into these places. And it's not that burial grounds or the Holy of Holies, um, et cetera, are forbidden. Um, you just have to prepare yourself before you go in there, right. right? So you have to cleanse yourself before you go into a mosque. You have to, like, there are things that you have to do before you go into a sacred environment. A lot of self-care that you're talking about. So it is very much that our mind is, we just slightly moved it over from <laughs> prepare yourself to go into some pl an elevated place as opposed to it being forbidden. Love um, it. That is amazing. I love that. So it's like, yes, it's taboo. Oh. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready. Don't want to change it. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, anything, yeah. anything, uh, we've got great comments and I saw so many wonderful friends. We didn't really, there weren't really questions so much in the chat, but. Um, I can't wait to read. I love to read chats when people are typing in their experience. I love that. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about this. We'll see who we want to talk to next time. And this has been beautiful, Michael. I just enjoy this. Thank you so much for wanting to do this. I, I just know that people are hungry for this. Yeah. People are hungry for just taking your time. And Yeah. I kept reminding myself to breathe from the belly, which I think we forget. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the simplest way to slow down is just yeah. to breathe. Um, well, I have a trick that I have a ring that reminds me to breathe. Okay, so when I'm with patients, people, or I hate to say patients, but I'm somewhere there. Um, I look at it, it reminds me to breathe, and when it reminds me to breathe, it reminds me to do all these things. Uh, get back in my mind, you know, get back here if I'm floating, whatever. Well, I forgot to look at it this whole time. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I, I forgot, I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing great. You were doing great. You were great. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you all for coming. Thank yeah. you. All right. Um, and we'll uh, maybe let Kaylee take us out with some music as we came yeah. in. Um, that, was, that was the slow walk was the song, yeah. right, Deanna? Yeah. The slow walk. I forgot the name. Digger, I think. Um, I, I forgot. I forgot his name. Terrific. All right. And we'll share this out with everyone um, after uh, in a couple days, we'll share out the video and um, we'll see you next month or whenever it is we decide we haven't figured it out. We're taking one step uh, in front of the other. Yeah. All right. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you all. Bye.